Okay, we will start. We will uh, the the our session uh, number seven on the security on the Korean Peninsula is open. We have one hour and a half <coughs> to uh, address this uh, particularly timely and, and, and difficult issue. Of course, I'm Benjamin Haute Couverture. I'm a senior research fellow at the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique uh, in Paris. Uh, uh, supporting to the support of effective multilateralism and, and the fact to address proliferation crisis uh, directly uh, are the two main pillars that were uh, highlighted this morning um, by High Representative Federica Mogherini when explaining the EU approach uh, towards international security issues. She said, I quoted this, uh, some, some, some words up, uh, this morning. She said, we have to deal with new crises exactly as we did with Iran. And she added, only multilateral diplomacy can stop Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions. And uh, could it mean a future involvement, direct or indirect involvement, of the EU into a new group of talks uh, in the region, in Northeast Asia? I think that this is a question to be asked. But whatever the the way, the means, this is the, the, the canvas, if I may, the, the backdrop of the EU uh, uh, involvement. And as to our uh, EU non-proliferation consortium, we've been very much involved recently since we organized, uh, with the collaboration of the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a track 1.5 seminar on DPRK ballistic and uh, nuclear uh, dimensions of the crisis in the peninsula last week in Seoul, uh, bringing together some 60 participants, including many uh, Korean officials dealing days and nights, according to them, with their northern neighbors and worries and ambitions. Uh, and I think that uh, a real sense of urgency was shared among us, among all the participants, the panelists, everyone, which means that this is not an issue to be dealt with by scholars, just as an interesting proliferation case study, uh, which it is, by the way, a very interesting one, but this is for real. This is the real world in Northeast Asia. And then uh, smart solutions have to be found, which means realistic and real responsible solutions. Neither literature nor political instrumentalization is needed. We within the consortium understand our task in that spirit. Having said that, it's my pleasure to give the floor to our three speakers this afternoon. The three of them come from the region. The countries are key stakeholders, the Republic of Korea, China, and Russia. And the entire involvement of China and Russia, of course, being to some extent allies uh, to the DPRK against the WMD programs of Pyongyang is a core issue uh, in the current deadlock and it must be addressed along with other issues. So I will first ask Alexander Voronsov from the Russian Academy of Sciences to take the floor. Uh, then uh, Cheng Jiaxiwei Sorry for yeah. <laughs> it's hard to pronounce. Cheng Xiaohe. Cheng Xiaohe. Jiang Cheng. Cheng. Uh, 
from Renmin University of China. <laughs> and Duyun. <laughs> and Duyun Kim, uh, who participated in our talks in Seoul uh, uh, last week. So please, Alexander, you have 10 minutes. Okay. 10 and 10, and we open the floor. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, organizer of the conference. This is ex ex extremely important and highly representative forum. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Chair that you started reminding us that today, Madame Magherini's idea, uh, I also wanted to concentrate attention to her assessments. Uh, because now we can see that uh, very recently the number of people, number of voices who understand uh, that uh, the quite long period of very one-sided policy towards North Korea, which was concentrated on the sanctions, um, pressure, isolation increasing, uh, such policy did not work. And uh, we have had for a long time that pressure, only pressure. Sanctions uh, does not work only because sanctions are not enough. We should increase sanctions. Let's stop any kind of talks. We should wait when sanctions imposed by the recent uh, UN Security Council resolution uh, on March of this year will be resulted and let's uh, the sanction work and so on and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And it was uh, difficult uh, to explain to uh, my colleagues uh, in many countries that I was surprised how it was possible not to see very clear, very simple reality, very strong mutual independence of two realities. To, to be short, more sanctions, more pressure against North Korea. North Korea means only more nukes and the missiles inside of North Korea. It's strong correlation. Sanctions means more nukes. And, uh, and just now, many people, and of course I'm happy was to hear today of uh, Madame Magherini expression, and of course uh, such knowledgeable and uh, well-informed people like Mr. James Clapper assessment, very recent assessment which was discussed today also and many others in South Korea, in the United States, in Europe, uh, more and more understand that only sanctions, only carrots, without, only sticks, I'm sorry, without carrot, does not work. And the engagement and uh, negotiations uh, restarting is necessary, and I agree with Madame uh, Magherini that only uh, multilateral diplomacy can stop a nuclear program. And uh, I think it's reasonable uh, to hear uh, what North Korean peoples are speaking. Uh, of course, they are grave, they are awful violator of Security Council resol resolutions. They must, they must, they must to improve, they must to stop, they must to disarm, uh, but uh, not to hear what they are speaking. We can disagree, strongly disagree with their position, with their arguments, but not to hear and neglect totally, ignore totally their way of thinking and assessments of situation, I think it's also unreasonable and not rational. And what they are speaking. I'm visiting North Korea every year, this year two times, and last time two weeks ago. And foreign ministry people are speaking when I ask them, about the possibility of negotiations, for example, with the United States. There is, uh, it, maybe a mistake, but it's my perception. There is widespread uh, perceptions uh, in the West countries that talk with North Korea is some kind of gift to North Korea. They won't talk very much with the United States, first of all, of course. And talk is uh, some kind of gift present. But North Korean people are speaking, I mean diplomats in foreign ministry, fifth dep department, for example, which dealing with relation between the United States and uh, North Korea. Yes, American guys are speaking. We don't want to have talk for talk. 
it, in regards with six party talk restarting. It's their position, we understand this position. But our position is we don't to have talk for our capitulation. It's our position. And these two lines are very different lines. And we cannot see any kind of opportunity to uh, of some changes in these lines. What does it mean? It means that the United States will follow their, li their own lines. It's increasing <coughs> sanctions, increasing military pressure, isolation. Okay, let's uh, them do it. But we will follow our lines, increase our military capability, and first of all, nuclear capability. It's our line. It's our choice. And they are doing it. Not only speaking, they are doing it. <laughs> what does it mean? What is the result of the absence, lack of any dialogue and negotiations? Uh, and uh, from my point of view, situation is aggravating indeed. And uh, it's more uh, dangerous than one year, ago, one year ago, two years ago, five years ago. Because uh, the intolerance from both sides are increasing. And position of uh, Republic of Korea government are also quite intolerable. They cut all lines of communication with North Korea purposefully. And they are sure that collapse of North Korea is imminent and will be very, very soon. But people who are visiting North Korea can see the improvement of uh, economy of North Korea. I can see, I am visiting every year, that beginning from 2000, okay, yes, uh, the second half of 19th was very deep, very, oh, very, very painful economic crisis inside of North Korea. But beginning from the 2000, very gradual but steady economic improvement started. And the last two, three years, this improvement became much more accelerated. So I don't know why, I don't know by what means, I can only guess. But it's, of, of course, for me, it's also very surprisingly. But at least for the today, uh, Kim Jong-un succeeded to fulfill his promise to Don John Noson to develop simultaneously uh, civil economy, <coughs> to improve living standards of populations, and uh, to increase uh, nuclear arsenal. It's real facts. I don't know what will be tomorrow, but until now, these two lines are developing. And economy, civil economy, and living standards of population are very gradually but increasing. They started more decisively economic reform, market-oriented economic reform, and of course, for sure, it's one of the source of their economic successful development. So the real picture of North Korea is not much, it's not hopeless. There became more self-confidence, not only in the world, but economic is better, defense capability also better. And uh, to my mind, uh, in this uh, situation when intolerance and decisiveness from both, both sides are increasing, when in Seoul more and more frequently are speaking about the decapitated <coughs> prevent strike on North Korea, and North Korea repeat also quite aggressively. For example, for the last time, two weeks ago, in foreign ministry, they told me, I am listening for the first time, that if the United States will really, or South Korea's alliance, will really attack us very limited, or do something practical against us in military way, our first goal wo will be to destroy Guam. Guam Island will be destroyed and will disappear underwater, to speak what they told. Of course, very, very unhappy situation. And if it will be continued, I can see only two uh, way out of the situation. All out war to eliminate North Korea, but it will be, as we can understand, 
awful scenario for all Korean Peninsula. South Korea will be also destroyed very, very, very greatly. Or negotiations, or engagement, what Madame Magherini emphasized today. And uh, what kind of negotiations? So of course, it's very difficult. We do remember the approach of the United States and their alliance to the six-party talk restarting. Precondition, pre-steps, as uh, my perception is, negotiations is some kind of gift for North Korea. But North Korea uh, position is that negotiations uh, can be maybe successful only if United States will change their mindset. And uh, to my mind, uh, all of us, we should a little bit to correct our perception of real today situation and maybe to correct our previous approaches. To some extent, maybe change our mindset. But according to North Korea, to change mindset means that the United States, first of all, and all countries of the world should accept and recognize their nuclear status. Of course, it's unacceptable. But what, from my point of view, is more acceptable and maybe really important is to accept not only in the words, but in our practical deals, the equal rights of North Korea in course of negotiation. The equal rights uh, respect and sovereignty respect. It's very crucially important for North Korea. They are very, very much sensitive to it. Some prestigious question also. Well, just now they answered me that all kind of talk contact with the previous U.S. administration are impossible. Why? Because they included, personally, Kim Jong in in the repression or sanction list, personally, Kim Jong in leader of the state. It's a huge humiliation. They told the United States crossed the red line, and we stopped all official contacts with the United States, only uh, track to conferences and contacts and framework of track to, okay, I'm finished. So, uh, to restart negotiation, I think we should start from the relatively simple, modest, but realistic goals. We should create some kind of mutually acceptable agenda from all party involved. Maybe it will be six party talks, maybe some other uh, format, but mutually acceptable agenda. And we should put forward and to achieve for us achievable goals, achievable goals, maybe very modest for the first step, and freeze of the nuclear program. If we will achieve it in the first or second stage, it will be very important, very important result. Somebody are speaking it's not so important, if not enough, only disarmament, but we should understand that for the time being, and in the at least short prospect, it's impossible. We should start from something what is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Voronsov, for these very interesting alternative options. Uh, Cheng, yeah, please. Thank you, Chairman, sir, and also thank organizers for inviting me here, so particularly the IS. And uh, I'd like to see the situations on Korea Peninsula in this way. So the situations is very volatile and very dangerous that we haven't seen uh, in the past uh, two or three decades. Hmm. It's volatile because a lot of things remain unsettled. For example, the DPRK is we continue to uh, test its missiles and possible six nuclear uh, detonations. And uh, to the old chaos, the political situation in South Korea you see, uh, becomes an international 
attraction, one of the international attractions. And also, in addition to DPRK's nuclear and missile provocations, and we found China and Russia on one side, and the United States and South Korea on the other side, has been locked and still locked in a dispute regarding uh, THAAD said. So all the senses is hmm, interacted with each other and make the situation on Korea Peninsula much volatile. And it's more dangerous because in the past one year, the DPRK has conducted nuclear tests for two times and also tested the missiles uh, according to my uh, account, about 26 times. 26 times. And uh, United States and the South Koreans and uh, heightened its preparedness for any possible mutual conflict with the DPRKs. Mm, mutual exercises and uh, rotating uh, uh, showing of strategic weapons uh, by the United States. And also the rumors uh, spreadings that the United States and South Korea may uh, take preemptive actions, mutual actions against, DP against DPRKs and DPRKs uh, leaders. So the situations become much dangerous. So the there's a lot of regions could contribute such a kind of situation, but DPRK's nuclear and missile issues has been and still one of the major sources of tensions in the regions. And we come over here so not to celebrate the ultimate solutions of DPRK's nuclear and missiles mm, dispute. Uh, we come over here, particularly for me to discuss DPRK's nuclear issues, and these issues has been remain uh, unsettled uh, for more than nearly three decades. And the United States and the DPRK signed a great framework in attempt to settle the DPRK's nuclear issues is failed. And China hosted and chaired a six-party talks in attempt to settle DPRK's nuclear issues and so far has failed. And uh, so DPRK's new cases still remain on the table, still irritate and divide the international community. And also the DPRK's uh, nuclear and missiles programs mm. had entered a very critical period of time. And this country is, is crossing, is crossing a shrehold, technology shrehold, of combining nuclear warhead and uh, various uh, missiles. And possibly, uh, these countries, we plan to deploy the nuclear weapons that could be used against South Koreans, United States, Japan, and possibly China. And also, uh, we witness the public opinions mm, is divided mm, with regard to the DPRK's nuclear program's future. And as uh, the colleagues mentioned, the United States uh, National Intelligence Directors, James Clappers, uh, public mentioned uh, the United States efforts to seek denuclearization of DPRKs uh, seemingly uh, is a lost cause. But on, on the other hand, and the United States deputies, uh, State Secretary Blinken still maintained uh, the United States aim, objective to pursue denuclearization of DPRK remain unchanged. And some of the Chinese scholars also believe it's impossible to persuade DPRK to abandon uh, it's impossible to force the DPRK to abandon its nuclear programs. 
and some still maintains. Uh, if we work hard and pressure these countries more hard, and maybe this the regime in Pyongyang uh, make choice between uh, regime survive and uh, abandonment of the nuclear programs. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I believe so far as the international efforts to pressure on the play, persuade DPRK to abandon its nuclear program uh, failed. But I, I'm not sure whether or not the efforts will continue to fail in the future. There are a number of reasons yeah, contributed to uh, faced uh, failures of the international efforts. Number one is the DPRK's uh, determination to press ahead with nuclear and missile pro development. If these countries ignore all the costs it may pay for its nuclear programs and defy international denouncement and United Nations Security Council's resolutions, and these countries uh, will do that. And nobody uh, can stop it. So I think that's the fundamental reasons. Second, the absence of the leadership uh, in the international communities, particularly the uh, United States uh, and China, uh, the two important countries, the key stakeholders in this, uh, in, on these issues, uh, refuse to assume the leadership. And the United States adopted so-called strategic patient strategies. And the Chinese adopted, uh, according to some of the South Korean friends, uh, 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 characterizations, China's version of strategic patience. Uh, but one thing for sure is China and the United States, that's two countries which have the capacity <coughs> to exercise its leadership um, in the past years have no political will to do so. And the absence of the leadership lead to a number of dismay's consequences. Number one, uh, the lack um, of coordinations uh, uh, between among the members, uh, key members of the six party talks. Um, and uh, the other five members of the six party talks uh, uh, could not uh, speak in one voice and cannot take actions in concert, mm. even though they share the same positions against DPRK's nuclear programs. And also, uh, the absence of the leadership leads to the absence of effective uh, proposals that could help to settle the DPRK's nuclear issues. In the past years, there's a lot of proposals spread of, among the key members of the Six Party Talks. But for me, it's none of them uh, were effective and efficient. Efficient. Hmm. So it's, uh, uh, I have to finish it up. Uh, and uh, you know, about one or two minutes. So in order to address DPRK's nuclear and missile uh, provocations, i like to suggest, uh, number one, and uh, China and the United States need to stand up and turn their zero-sum game into a, a plus-sum game. Mm. Because in the past years, the two countries played zero-sum game on the Korean Peninsula. I think they need to turn such a kind of game into a win-win mm. situation and exercise a leadership. Exercise a leadership. Certainly, uh, such a kind of leadership uh, could not exclude uh, other key members, South Koreans and uh, Russians and uh, Japan, <laughs> North Korea. But China and the United States need to assume more responsibilities. And second, mm. the two countries, China and the United States, need to change mm. its outdated policies. 
and to take a proactive pro approach hmm. to seek uh, solutions to DPRK's uh, nuclear issues. Hmm. Third, and uh, to avoid uh, all the Kimber stakeholders need to avoid taking unilateral actions that may cause suspicions, divisions among other members, and also avoid thinking point each other's. Uh, and China and the United States have played in the past years. And the last, but not least, other members, because to deal, to cope with the DPRK's nuclear and provocation is not a single country's missions, it's collective development in Davos. So all the members, uh, China, United States, South Korea, and Japan, need to synchronize their policies, hopefully early next year, after the United States new president uh, is elected and uh, assume its presidencies. So I'm stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheng. Du Yan. Share with us your vision, <laughs> the objective of <laughs> negotiation, <laughs> your methodology, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, first, uh, I would like to thank Mark and Benjamin and the uh, organizers of this very important and timely conference. I, as Benjamin just said, will jump right into the way forward. Uh, I will give you my bare bone bottom lines, <laughs> and perhaps uh, during the Q&A, I can unpack some of the context behind what I'm about to say. First, uh, it is difficult to find or expect uh, a new silver bullet idea that will magically just solve this problem uh, because we're dealing with generally the same uh, demands from each party. In terms of the vision and end states, uh, we need a grand design for a stable and prosperous Northeast Asia. This includes a nuclear weapons free North Korea, or some would say, argue, Korean Peninsula, it includes a region that coexists peacefully with North Korea eventually integrated in the community. And it involves and includes an end to the Korean War, establishment of a peace regime, and eventual reunification of the peninsula. A holistic, comprehensive policy toward North Korea is imperative. Uh, a, a simple, narrow, non-proliferation approach only addressing Pyongyang's nuclear missile programs uh, will not solve the North Korea problem or its intertwined uh, regional challenges. Now, there's a lot of talk and a lot of frustration about the lack of talks between the U.S. and North Korea and involved parties. However, currently the U.S. and North Korea, they each domestically lack the political space to engage in serious negotiations. But when the time is ripe, negotiations, of course, are the primary way to find uh, a way forward. Now the objective of negotiations, as an interim goal, it always has been and it should continue to be uh, a verifiable, a verified freeze. Uh, but this should not be the ultimate objective. Uh, the longer term and ultimate objective must be complete and verifiable denuclearization, regardless of how uh, difficult or unrealistic this may uh, appear today or else the region will face uh, bigger nuclear challenges and it will blow uh, a, a grave, it will deal a uh, grave blow to the non-proliferation regime if we do not uh, make sure that the end goal is complete denuclearization. Uh, the other objective of ne negotiations, well, it, sure, it involves a peace treaty, but a peace treaty discussion is too soon. Uh, will hold nuclear talks hostage to peace treaty talks, uh, and so uh, this should not commence too soon. Uh, there was clear understanding during the six-party talks process that discussions for a peace treaty or a peace regime would occur once the relevant parties were able to draw up a blueprint for what the third and final stage of dismantlement might look like. So North Korea knows this and it agreed to this. Uh, so it, has, it should and has not forgotten that history. Well, how do we get there? Uh, in terms of methodology, I believe we must retain the six-party talks agreements and its framework and its process with necessary upgrades to meet um, today's challenges. Uh, this six-party process uh, serves critical political and functional purposes and addresses all parties' concerns, including 
and especially Pyongyang's security concerns. Uh, it has already established a pathway to the vision and end states I mentioned above, uh, and, it ensures buy and it ensures a buy-in and assistance from necessary countries like Japan and Russia that are needed to implement the, the deals in its entirety. Uh, and within this framework, various geometric configura configurations of negotiations can talk, uh, can, um, can convene uh, freely uh, within the six-party framework without having to reinvent the wheel for negotiations. Now going forward, uh, the next uh, Clinton administration uh, should employ <laughs> a toughness and readiness approach. Now, I did not coin this concept. It was actually coined by a brilliant colleague of mine. Uh, it should begin, the next administration should begin a comprehensive uh, policy re review up and down, all around, bottom up, top down, a review during the transition, uh, but of course in earnest in the first 100 days of office that reviews and tests uh, traditional and bold new thinking across the entire spectrum of pressure and engagement. Now, the elements uh, for this toughness and diplomatic readiness approach, I believe some, there are some pillars um, that are included. The first is effective and credible pressure to enable diplomacy to work effectively. Uh, now, this approach is because of where we are today in the security situation and having dealt with this and having had so much experience with this in negotiations for over 20 years. Uh, it includes a priority to, to U.S. alliances and alliance coordination. It includes strengthened defense, deterrence, and military readiness to deal with future North Korean provocations and any October surprises. It includes pressure and engagement with China where necessary and needed. Uh, and it includes a readiness to negotiate a reasonable deal with North Korea when the time comes. Finally, China also has the responsibility to try newer and bolder measures going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Du Yun. Thank you very much, uh, the three of you. I uh, note that none of you addressed the question of an EU leverage. <laughs> <laughs> In the future. We spent the whole week. You are the so right <laughs> Last <laughs> was week was all about that. Last week was all about it. I know, I know, but we are in Brussels. Yes, we're right. not in yeah. Seoul yeah. anymore. You have, you have good history <laughs> of engagement. I, we know, history. absolutely. This, this is the point. And this is the reason why uh, maybe the but EU you is so... Is you withdrew from the uh, Absolutely. The reason why maybe the EU has become so shy about this after the collapse of the Kido, and we all know this story. But still, be, be gentle. We are in Brussels. Do you think there is a leverage for the EU in the, 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 the year and the, the future years to come? Is the EU... Uh, 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 being a global player in, on non-proliferation and disarmament, disarmament matters, and if it is so, what leverage uh, 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 is, uh, um, well, I, I'm talking about EU, the EU, of course, I'm talking about the member states of the EU, and we know all the disagreements within member states within the EU on the PRK uh, um, uh, issue, of course. Thank you very much for, 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 for all these. The floor is open. I'm sure we have, yes, we have so many uh, people. We try to have maybe four or five, okay? Th three or, uh, or four rounds of question. Charlotte Bossillon first. Maurizio, you, sir, because you wanted the floor this morning, you had not because the mark, because we did not want to give you the, <coughs> the floor. And then uh, Ambassador Treza and uh, Mr. Ivan. First wave, please. Thank Charlotte you Boussillon. very much. Uh, Charles Boussillon, assistant professor at the Sorbonne Law School in Paris. Uh, Dion, I'm very glad to see you. Uh, it's so good to see you again, too. Oh, you sure it's, it work? uh, it works? It works. <laughs> Is okay. it working? Yeah? So, Good Benjamin, feedback. I'm very glad you picked on the question of the EU role, so I, I will spare this to you. I was curious to know from the panelists uh, whether you have views on the way. Um, to bring North Korea to abide by its uh, undertakings. We know from the past that this is not a problem for North Korea to undertake new obligations, but very quickly, these are violated again. 
So do you see new means, techniques, to build confidence and to accompany the implementation of future undertakings? Thank you. Thank you. Maurizio Martellini here. Uh, congrat congratulations. Uh, I appreciate very much the, uh, the, the intervention of uh, Cheng, uh, Ms. Cheng. Uh, my comment, I visit many times Pyongyang, uh, my comment is very short. Uh, the philosophy of the EU non-proliferation is not only multilateralism, it's also concrete uh, cooperative mechanism like, uh, for instance, medical diplomacy, uh, scientist engagement, uh, and other things like we done in the past uh, after the Cold War. So uh, I guess that uh, I fully agree that uh, it's almost impossible to see uh, a solution of this conundrum without a real comprehensive uh, package. And uh, the EU must uh, play, a, it's your question is crucial, must play a, a more central role in terms of uh, cooperative uh, engagement. Uh, even if uh, North Korea is a sort of a paria state or like that, I never believe it in this kind of language. Uh, so this is very important because uh, um, in all my visit uh, there, uh, there is a, a mistrust, uh, a basically mistrust. So why not, instead to make a generic uh, le, scientific, uh, I mean, policy discussion about multilateralism, why not uh, to apply the mechanism that we used in the past vis-a-vis -vis, uh, countries in transition? So Thank you, Maurizio. Sir. The microphone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first question goes to, uh, Mrs., uh, to Mrs. Kim. Is North Korea a rational or irrational state in managing the nuclear crisis? And second question to Mr. Cheng. What extent, to what extent China has a leverage on North Korea in solving the nuclear crisis? Thank you. Ambassador Treza has just written a very interesting piece on the PRK, which is uh, published on the website of the consortium. Please. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning it. Uh, uh, indeed, to, to respond uh, to your question, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, about the possible role of, of um, the EU, this is not a particularly propitious time for, for negotiations, not only because of and tension, but also because uh, the United States and the later uh, uh, the Republic of Korea are going to celebrate <laughs> presidential elections, so it will take time in any case to establish a new, a new policy. But uh, having said that, um, the EU has certain credentials, not only from a historical point of view, uh, but also more recently because uh, of its constructive role in uh, the solving of the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear crisis. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, Federica Mogherini called for innovative uh, suggestions, uh, innovative solutions uh, to, to this issue. And indeed, uh, the precedent of uh, the way in which the European U the Europe uh, uh, overcame uh, the Cold War, especially through the establishment of uh, the OSCE, the, the whole process of Helsinki, of confidence building measures, and so on, is, uh, let's say, a precedent which has been studied very closely by the two Korean sides, not necessarily to follow exactly the same pattern, but in any way. But, uh, uh, if we want to go to, into more detail, there's also the precedent of the INF uh, Treaty, which uh, in the 80s was uh, an instrument to overcome the Cold War. Uh, in that occasion, uh, to 
respond to the deployment in Russia of certain types uh, of Soviet Union, certain types of, mm, of missiles. Uh, NATO countries uh, uh, made a so-called double decision. On one hand, to deploy new missiles equivalent to the Russian deployment, and on the other side, to propose a negotiation to, to eliminate them. Uh, a similar situation is now taking place in, in, uh, in the Korean Peninsula, where the United States uh, and the uh, uh, Republic of Korea intended to deploy uh, missile defense uh, terminal, the, the TAD uh, missiles, which is an initiative which is hated by China, China. And, and Russia. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, there could be a similarity, even uh, if uh, uh, this deployment which will take place would become a kind of bargaining chip to convince uh, DPRK to get rid of its nuclear program in exchange of the non-deployment or of the withdrawal of uh, these missile defense uh, uh, systems uh, in, in South Korea. Uh, this is an idea which I put to the, <laughs> to the panel. Of course, it <laughs> deserves a, a lot of thinking, but in any case, uh, I, I would like to have some preliminary reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Robert Einhorn, and then we close the first uh, round. Thank you. Um, Alexander, I agree with you and uh, High Representative Mogherini that pressure alone is not going to resolve this problem. I think no matter how much pressure, North Korea will continue on its current course. Uh, diplomacy uh, negotiations will be essential uh, to get uh, uh, North Korea to, uh, to uh, freeze and roll back its program. But diplomacy without sufficient leverage is not going to work either. And I think it's worth looking back to the Iran case. Uh, negotiations with Iran proceeded for three or four years uh, with Iran under sanctions, but not terribly strong sanctions. And Iran was not serious about negotiations during that period. But then in the 2012-2013 period, sanctions really ratcheted up. Uh, and in part because China uh, played a major role. Uh, it cut back its imports of Iranian crude oil by over 50%. Now, China had its own way of doing that. It never admitted it. Uh, it published on some obscure Chinese website that it had decided to diversify its sources of crude oil, but nonetheless, uh, it cut back, and that sent a very powerful signal to Iran, and then negotiations began in earnest after that point. I think the same will be true in the North Korea case. At the present time, pressures against North Korea are not sufficient uh, and have to be ratcheted up. There's a framework uh, in Resolution uh, 2270 to do that, and now there are discussions in New York on uh, even stronger sanctions, uh, but there are um, there are ways that uh, Security Council members uh, can um, uh, create certain uh, loopholes. Uh, I'm thinking in particular about the import of, uh, of uh, North Korean uh, coal and other minerals. Uh, so my question is this. Uh, is there a recognition, and I'm speaking really to Mr. Chung, Mr. Uh, Bronsov, um, whether sanctions have to be strengthened quite a bit uh, before the leverage will be there to get the kind of negotiated solution that you've all talked about. And I think what you say, Alexander, about starting with a freeze uh, en route to eventual denuclearization is the right way to go. But at the present time, I don't think there's sufficient leverage to get there. Thank you very much for those very, very specific comments. Uh, I'm sure we all uh, are impatient to hear your answers. Uh, first, Duyun, uh, Cheng, and uh, Alexander, if you wish. Sure. Okay. 
Okay. I was hoping to go last, but that's fine. Uh, on the question of uh, EU role, and I know we've had several discussions, um, well, extensive discussions last week in Seoul, uh, but my, I guess my bottom line for now is uh, I cannot, um, in practical terms, I'm not sure how that would work. Uh, we have experience in the six-party talks where it was difficult enough to align and come to consensus and try to figure out a way um, to, to align all six different interests. And so to have another uh, actor at the table, I'm not sure how that would work um, practically and feasibly, although last week in Seoul, Charlotte did mention um, an idea of perhaps giving uh, the EU a facilitator role and not um, a vote at the table, and that's something that we could probably examine. Uh, however, at the same time, we've had, uh, and I say this with all due respect to all of my Chinese colleagues, but in the past we've seen in the six-party talks uh, that yes, China has been active and proactive, but it eventually came to a situation where uh, China, China ended up um, playing more of the bookkeeper of schedules and not um, um, active uh, facilitator. Uh, and so uh, these are some factors that we should consider realistically and practically going forward. On the question of whether North Korea is a rational actor or not, uh, I would say that North Korea is uh, a rational actor, or Kim Jong-un and his predecessors are. And I say this uh, because I'm using the classical definition that we use in IR. Uh, the, the Kims uh, act in their national interest, uh, and so they don't, and they make calculations according to the national interest, uh, and uh, they don't do anything that is suicidal for their regime. And so in that sense, I say yes. Uh, in terms of, and I, I agree with everything that Bob said, so I don't have to um, reiterate. I, I, there's something that we need to remember, and, and I know there are a lot of people, again, who are frustrated that there aren't, um, active discussions and negotiations or, or even just talks between the U.S. and North Korea. Uh, but we do need to remember that during the Obama administration, and up until very recently, uh, North Korea has actually uh, rejected the administration's um, invitations for talks. Uh, so it, we've, we're, at a, we're in a situation where it's even difficult to bring North Korea to the table to just talk. And there had been a point in very recent uh, history that um, where the Obama administration was openly, um, openly open to having bilateral discussions without any preconditions anytime, anywhere. But even the North has rejected that. Uh, and so we're at, in a situation where it's not just a matter of um, talking. It, it's, a, it's a matter of trying to get them to the table. And I think part of this reason is the difficulty in getting North Korea to the table now uh, is first, uh, they only want to resume discussions on their terms, uh, but also I, I wonder if if they, you know, we talk about leverage building for pressure on our side, I wonder if uh, the North is in their process of trying to build their own leverage to enter into negotiations, and that leverage is not only, well, first and foremost, it's on uh, the nuclear and missile capabilities, but it's not just that. I, I think it's more uh, comprehensive for them to, to build their country into a more quote-unquote powerful state before they can enter into these negotiations. Uh, so that's something to consider. Um, the question about the comments on, on THAAD and other precedents, um, I, I, realistically, I don't see um, the US or South Korea using THAAD as a bargaining chip at all. Um, and the other precedents, the context is different. Uh, we're in a situation, the reality is, is that the U.S., South Korea, the international community will not recognize North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. And so we need to keep that context in mind uh, when we're thinking of new ideas and how um, um, to, to incentivize or, or find solutions, or to find um, practical solutions on this matter. Okay, so there's a number of questions I have to address. Number one, sir. Uh, so whether or not it's a bargaining chip, and uh, I may disagree with you. Sure, disagree all the way. <laughs> and uh, it's a bargaining chip. And the United States government made it very clear that uh, South Korean United States tried to deploy the site system in attempt to not push China to turn against the DPRKs. And uh, that's the one uh, uh, move on the part of the United States and South Koreans. But whether or not it's a uh, bargain chips uh, could be exchanged, 
and again uh, for some things. I don't think so. And uh, that's the one. The EU rules. And I uh, personally uh, once opposed uh, EU's participation of the six party talks a few years ago and uh, South Koreans and uh, try to invite DPRK, uh, uh, EU to attend six party talk and uh, I made it clear uh, on the grounds. Number one, I, I don't know, at that I didn't know whether or not EU uh, had strong motivations to, to attend as the EU struggle to deal with uh, Russia, Ukraine, to deal with the financial crisis. Mm. Second, the member states of the Sixth Party Talk, their relationship are quite complicated. The United States, Japan, and South Korea uh, could conduct more consultations and could take a united uh, positions within the Six Party Talk and form a small bloc. And China and uh, Russians and, uh, and uh, work together. So EU's participations will complicate the compositions of the Six Party Talk and tilt uh, <laughs> the balance power within the Six Party toward United States, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, but, uh, uh, but recently, uh, I uh, uh, changed my mind a little bit, and uh, I'm quite open to flexible, multiple dialogues, uh, trilateral dialogue, five-party uh, dialogue, six-party dialogue, whatever, and keep the dialogue going on. And uh, sir, uh, the gentleman's questions, the China's leverages on DPRK, China has uh, quite strong leverages of the DPRK. So since China is the DPRK's immediate neighbor and number one trading partner, but the problem is whether or not China has political will to use the leverages. But there's two factors I think is, uh, uh, have more impact on China's thinking is whether or not use the leverage to achieve political objectives. And the number one is whether or not the DPRK is deserve it. Uh, since China now uh, processes a number of uh, uh, <coughs> strong weapons, heavy weapons, uh, the weapon China, if China use the heavy weapons, and the weapons can be used to kill the regime in Pyongyang. Mm. Second, and uh, Pyongyang has been China's traditional strategic asset. Mm. And uh, even though uh, more and more Chinese believe the DPRK is not a strategic asset, uh, it's a strategic burden. Uh, but I think that uh, most Chinese scholars still believe DPRK is, is a valuable strategic asset. It's not time for China to abandon the asset lightly. So uh, uh, if China need to change its mind to use the strong weapon against DPRK, China need, uh, China and the United States need to cut big deals uh, to build trust. Uh, and turn the zero-sum game so far into some kind of plus-sum game. If such game could not be changed, and I don't think China will abandon DPRK. So that sense uh, has more to do with the, the grand relationship between China and the United States, particularly the com competitions between two countries has been hidden up. So how to the, uh, handle the DPRK's nuclear provocation has something to do with the ongoing development uh, of the relationship between China and the United States. And uh, I think it's a, a miss. Any other questions?
I'm going to stop here. Okay. Yeah. Do you Thank very you. quickly to answer your um, So to, to, to briefly continue the, de the debate between Xiaohe and me uh, on that, uh, there is a difference between um, a bargaining chip and versus um, a political card. Now, as long as no, that is there because of the threat posed by North Korea's short and mid-range uh, missiles. Uh, however, yes, uh, South Korea has begun to realize that there is political utility uh, of that uh, in terms of trying to persuade China to make to be more proactive and to make a more a decisive decision on North Korea. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I still, again, cannot see a scenario where uh, the U.S. and South Korea would use it to bargain away that under certain circumstances. Now, the political use of it to pursue China has been, you know, we don't need that if we didn't have the North Korean nuclear missile problem, uh, and as an incentive and as a persuasion point uh, for China. Uh, now, that said, one variable in this equation really is uh, the fate of that, meaning whether that will complete its deployment within this pres South Korean presidential term and who is the next South Korean president. If we have a progressive uh, South Korean president, uh, that might uh, make this equation a little bit uh, different. Uh, but we'll have to see uh, how that unfolds going forward in the months to come. Yeah, the quick response. <laughs> Very quick. Very, Very quick. quick. Uh, and uh, as still maintains, uh, it's a parking tape. But the problem is the parking tape is too pure. And China so far does not want to make to, to, to make a deal to to change anything with it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice questions. And uh, our first question, which a lady asked about, uh, is it possible to create some new tools uh, instrument uh, to force North Korea to fulfill their obligation? I think it's uh, to maybe uh, some extent uh, widespread uh, uh, mis misperceptions that only North Korea violate their obligations. All other parties involved are strongly committed to their obligation and only North Korea time, time by time, next, next, next violate. I do remember when I was in the Brookings Institution, and as it was, as usually, there were a lot of meetings and conferences in DC, and in one conference dealing with North Korea, a very you know, famous and very experienced American expert, Mr. Siegel, uh, created some kind of table. And he closed one column of table and uh, showed another one. And in this part was uh, very in detail, uh, in detail pointed all agreement which North Korea violated. When and in which point they violated many, many, many agreements and obligations. And uh, all people uh, in the floor were agree, yes, we do remember these agreements, we do remember their violations. After it, he opened the second half of the table. And in this part where pointed when the United States violated their obligations. And the picture became absolutely as a mirror, the same. The same obligation were violated by both sides. Who was the first, who was the second, it's another question. So we do remember when uh, the North Korea feel that uh, they are engaged in some agreement, for example, like a grid framework of 1994. They were abided for quite a long time to these obligations. When they were sure that six-party talk were developed seriously, they also did not violate their obligations. By the way, in 2009, when uh, six party talks stopped. Not only North Korea violated their obligations, and South Korea also did not fulfill completely their obligation 
dealing with the second stage of denuclearizations and etc. Uh, and it's an important question because uh, when arms control, arms reductions, non-proliferation agenda only is in center of the topic, North Korea is ready to cooperate. But when they begin to feel, to feel that there is a hidden agenda aimed at regime change, and uh, non-proliferation agreement are using as cover to produce, to put forward the hidden agenda, they began to talk, they are not interested in such kind of negotiations. So it's also important to take into consideration. But question, of course, very, very important. Have to find some mechanism to provide the fulfillment of obligation, but it's concern not only North Korea, but all parties involved. And Russia, for example, long time ago uh, proposed the crossed obligation of all parties involved, for example. Everybody look to each other, how you fulfill your obligation. And uh, Mr. Einhorn, of course I agree with your picture. And of course, uh, I agree that uh, the, in case of Iran, the really painful sanctions uh, in the last stage of sanction policy uh, worked, worked. Uh, and there are many attempts to compare Iran situation and North Korea situation. But there are many differences, yes, as you know, you know better than me. Uh, Iran economy was incomparably much more deeper and widely involved, engaged, involved economy. It was more easy to find and to implement really very sensitive sanctions against economy of Iran. North Korea <coughs> engagement and in interdependence with the world much more less. The second import important difference, in that period of time of sanctions, Iran did not produce nuclear weapon. North Korea is doing. And uh, if sanctions will continue increased, increased, undoubtedly, at least for me, it's undoubtedly, they will continue to produce also nukes and missiles program. And just now, they reached the stage of their missile nuclear programs long term, yes? But now they reach stage when uh, they are succeeded to produce more sophisticated and advanced uh, kind of weapons and missiles. So, if we will continue the present policy and will wait when sanctions will give result, they will succeed to produce a few more nuclear tests, missile tests, and it will reach more high level of the nuclear arsenal. And when negotiation will start, it will be more difficult to reduce every step ahead in the development of the nuclear program make more difficult to force the country to disarm, to make step back. So we should also take into consideration this reality. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the picture is nice, but in the <coughs> real world, uh, when the <coughs> For example, six party talks participants' interests uh, are not equal, not the same. <coughs> Every country has their own interest, objectively. For example, the United States is placed far from Korean Peninsula. No, China and Russia has the joint border with North Korea. And objectively, we, maybe more than you, are sensitive uh, in order to prevent all out war in Korea, because it will affect us directly and strongly. So, China and Russia objectively will define and fulfill sanctions measure more carefully. And uh, in practical way, how to, for example, Russia has 17 kilometers of joint border, yes, with North Korea. China, 1,300 have to close totally this border in practical way. Is it achievable? 
for example, even the United States with their the most advanced, sophisticated technical, military, and etc., etc. means uh, have difficulties to close totally or to control strictly the border with Mexico. Trump was just going to take care of that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but they were attempts, yes, not only voices to attempt to create wall along the border, yes, with Mexico. And China also should to create wall on the border with North Korea. Practically, it's not easy. So I think we should uh, calculate carefully all, all pro and contra in this uh, scenario. Thank you, Dr. Vorontsov. Uh, well, I think we can all agree on the fact that, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, DPRK is not part of our globalized world. The reason why most of the, the trade of the country is made with China and Russia, which, of course, it's a basis for uh, leverage, if I may. Um, we have a second round of questions. First, sir, then you, sir. Okay, then, then you second, and, uh, and Mark then, and, and we'll see after, okay? Please make it fast, because we just have 15 minutes. Thank you. I'm Erwin Hechtel from Germany. Uh, uh, starting from the fact that everyone agrees uh, that the six-party talks are stuck and we uh, uh, are encouraged to have more imagination and uh, to seek more uh, smart multilateralism. Now I'm, I'm going uh, to let my imagination run and forget about multilateralism. Uh, I invite you to a thought experiment. Uh, not along the lines of multilateralism, but bilateralism. Let us assume uh, that North and South Korea come together uh, to seek unification. <coughs> Everyone will agree, very unlikely. Let's just assume it. Let's assume that uh, conditions, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, are appropriate for such a development. Uh, North and South Korea seek unification. And remember, I come from Germany, and I have a memory that uh, 30 years ago, it was impossible to imagine that the two German uh, states could come together to form a, a unified uh, Soviet state. Now let us assume uh, in this uh, course of unification uh, North Korea would not renounce uh, its nuclear weapons and uh, to inject uh, uh, an element of uh, reality, let us assume that the two countries would not come together like the German two states uh, in one stroke form one sovereign state. But let us assume these states as an intermediate uh, stage agreed to form some confederation. One party of this confederation is still uh, a unified, uh, uh, sorry, is still a nuclear armed country. <laughs> Uh, what uh, what happens then? Uh, uh, it, it's not unclear in terms of the uh, of the uh, nuclear non-proliferation uh, uh, treaty, uh, and uh, it is not clear how the world community uh, would react. Uh, probably the world community, the Security Council, would step in if it's one sovereign country with nuclear weapons. Thank you for your comment, because we are running out of time. Well, my invitation is simply consider this possibility. What wow. would it mean for the non-proliferation? OK, thank you very much. Well, which is a very hazardous yes. scenario, if I may, but why not? Uh, please. I have two short comments, um, but I will keep them both brief. Um, when you mentioned name? about your, uh, sorry, your my name. name's Christina, I'm from Rusi. Um, when you mentioned about your trips to North Korea, 
and you mentioned the economy is looking prosperous. Do you think that's authentic, and how far do you think that actually spreads beyond what you see as a, as a visitor? And do you think that's sustainable? And, and if not, what then happens to the, the security on the peninsula if that economic prosperity that you, you witness um, is not long-term? Uh, and secondly, for Ms. Kim, how do you think the domestic political situation in South Korea at the moment is going to um, hinder any prospects of um, making headway with the North Korean nuclear issue? Um, I think that the most recent polls I saw this morning were Park's um, rating was down to something like 9% of, of approval. And if that then impacts how um, the relationship she's managed to build up with Japan in terms of the Comfort Women deal, if that then doesn't go ahead and that impacts broader relations with Japan, how does that impact the, the way the region can move forward cohesively? Thank you. Mark? Mark Fitzpatrick, WIWS. When we talk about the EU role, it's usually engagement, and it's usually how can we engage more. But the engagement dial is not just in one direction. It can be turned in the other direction. Seven EU uh, states have embassies in Pyongyang with ambassadors. Um, South Korea's government policy is to try to isolate North Korea. The mood in, in Seoul when we were at the conference was one of, this is no longer business as usual. Things have gotten so dire with North Korea's escalation of nuclear and missile testing that real pressure has to be put on North Korea. So what other ways can the EU put pressure on? I think this is something that also needs to be considered. Um, uh, visas can be denied. Uh, travel bans can be imposed. The uh, travel warning uh, not to go to North Korea could be uh, enforced. Uh, North Korean uh, money men who somehow um, accumulate money in European countries and send them back uh, to Kim Jong-un. This you know, pressure could be put on to stop this. I think there are ways that European countries uh, might be asked in the next couple of years what more they can do to add to the pressure. In, I'm not advocating it right now, but I'm, this is something that will need to be on the policy agenda. Thank you. Sir? So, you, and, and the last one uh, after one. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's working? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Adair Vicent. I am from European University Institute. I have two uh, questions, a short one, I, I believe. Um, the first one is about uh, if we consider that uh, North Korea is uh, actually a rational actor, uh, then we have to, to think about why they have nuclear weapons. And one of the two reasons I think about is protection of the regime, their protection, and also territorial integrity. Uh, so if you believe in this, uh, what kind of assurances uh, P5 or another um, important states could, um, could give to, to North Korea uh, for them to, to disarm uh, their nuclear weapons? And um, take into account that, uh, for instance, the 1994 Budapest Membrane didn't actually work on that, making that assurance. Uh, second question is about the European Union. One of the biggest uh, assumptions of the European Union uh, in terms of foreign policy is that uh, they are a trade power. And actually most of the, the negotiations uh, with other countries are, 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 uh, are making sure that these trade relations are important for, 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 for some, for, for, uh, for the European Union to have some outcomes. Uh, so do you think that uh, one of, one of the, the, um, like the solutions for this uh, deadlock could be actually progressively not, not excluding totally the sanctions, because I believe that the sanctions are actually not working, but making sure that if, if uh, North Korea is willing to neg negotiate, the EU might increase their trade relations and therefore might, for the size of the EU and North Korea, there might be incentive for, for them to give up of their nuclear. Thank you. And the last one, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, my name is uh, Ki Kim, political minister at the Korean mission in Brussels. Thank you uh, for the very informative and extensive uh, observations and presentations from the panel. 
Can you speak louder, please? Yes. Um, I think we need to start to think uh, in terms of um, the past histories and experiences when we address North Korea's nuclear uh, problem. North Korea uh, repeatedly violated its commitment. That is the main cause of the lack of dialogue and the failure of dialogue. And um, dialogue per se does not uh, solve the problem. That doesn't guarantee the solution. So I think we need to uh, have credible commitment from the North Korean side. And um, now is the time to increase pressure. And I uh, fully uh, subscribe to um, the view I expressed by Secretary Aino. We need to ratchet up the pressure so that North Korea uh, change eventually their strategic thinking. And having said this, uh, I would like to um, emphasize the role of the European Union the bedrock of their policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea has a combination of two elements, critical and engagement. And now is the time to ratchet up critical part of this equation. And we look forward to uh, stronger measures building on um, the UN Security Council Resolution 270, filling up any possible loopholes. And we had um, certain discussions about that system this is purely of um, defensive nature. We made this very clearly so far. And uh, we do not want to have any um, disagreement with the neighbor, but um, this is um, a, uh, you know, I mean, uh, decision that we really need to uh, make to safeguard um, the lives and uh, safety of our people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we start with Mr. Voronsov. Would you be so kind to repeat your question? I didn't hear you very well. Okay, thank you. Sorry. From my point of view, yes, I told that I'm visiting every year. Uh, I think that during the last, it means 15, 16 years, they have steady, gradual improvement of economic situation. And in the last year, few years, by the way, under Kim Jong-un, uh, this development, positive development, accelerated. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons I told, uh, of course, it's uh, the economic reform. And became more decisive. Uh, for example, in 2015 May, we visited uh, North Korea. It was lack of water, and they told, uh, uh, and it was for a long time interruption, interruption of water supply in the hotel. And they told it's a result of the bigger uh, lack of water because uh, snow during the winter was not enough. And everybody expected that the harvest in the autumn will be very poor but it did not happen. Har harvest was not so bad. And uh, we asked why, how it was possible to uh, avoid the um, bad result. And they told that because the peasant became in real insensitive, 40% and 50% of harvest remain in their own disposal. They try to find water everywhere where it's possible and to bring this water to the part, and they succeeded. One of the results. Some people in, inside North Korea are speaking that nuclear weapons is more cheaper than conventional weapons. And when they succeeded uh, visible and uh, understandable result in the, for, for themselves, that they succeeded indeed in the, the nuclear uh, program, uh, they reduced considerably their expenses for the conventional weapons and uh, put additional resources. And some things. So, uh, of course, sanctions, uh, it's serious uh, question. Of course, it's affect their economic development, but until now, they succeeded to adjust to sanctions regime. And they are speaking, we are living under sanctions during 40 years, 40. It, from the beginning of the Republic creation, maybe more than 40. 
and we succeeded to find some mechanisms to adjust uh, the sanctions effect. So I cannot predict how much it will continue under the very strong sanctions. But until now, what we can see, they succeeded to find the, the opportunity and find some resources for positive economic development. And it's continued to a quite long period of stay. They succeeded to find finally their own style of economic reform. For a long time they learned the experience of China, Vietnam, Russia, other countries, economic market-oriented economic reform. It seems to me that just now they succeeded to adjust uh, it for their peculiarities, for their specific conditions. So, once again, I cannot predict, but uh, it's possible that the positive uh, trend of economic development will continue. What about the more hard sanctions, more tough sanctions? No, I don't know. It should be defined by the participants of uh, Security Council. Uh, and once again, I repeat, I cannot predict, I don't know, simply, and I cannot know. Uh, but uh, all countries ha has their own interest. China has own business with North Korea and try to protect it. Russia also has own business with North Korea and tried to save it. Uh, it was in case with uh, 2270, yes, uh, resolution. So it's objective, objective elements uh, that cannot be neglected. And uh, yes, and the European unity representative are doing business, successful business in North Korea. Uh, approximately 30 million uh, euros, 10 years before it was th 300 million, so it was decreased by 90%. There is n nothing, no, no trade. But North Korea succeeded to produce excellent goat cheese. And uh, definitely <laughs> some European guy helped them do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> with their uh, sanctions and uh, isolations. We do remember that uh, during the period of uh, Kim De Jun and No Mo Hyun president in, in uh, South Korea, the South Korea was the main trade partner of North Korea, six, about six billions of dollars. And South Korea invested a considerable amount of money to North Korea. And uh, as I know, some economic um, uh, specialists in South Korea hoped that it's some kind of linkage, some kind of leverage over North Korea. Just now, inter-Korean trade, zero. No investments, no contact. But North Korea demonstrated that they can live without South Korea assistance. They can live and develop. So we should, when we speak about sanctions, um, yes, in the Iran case, it's worked. Uh, but in North Korea, have a little bit more peculiarities. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Do you have to add something? Uh, well, by the way, we, we, we still have time because we, there is no, nothing to do at six. <laughs> well, the reception, <laughs> the reception between six and seven, I mean, we cannot be late to maybe one minute or 10 minutes before drinking. <laughs> so uh, l l l let us uh, Yeah, at which point we will all need a drink at that time because this issue is so sobering. Uh, on the comments about um, reunification, with a nuclear-armed North Korea. Bottom line is I, I cannot see a scenario in which we would use that term, one sovereign state with the North having nuclear weapons. Uh, we would have to call it something very different, perhaps a two-state situation. Uh, so I, I, I cannot imagine that scenario at all with nuclear weapons in the North, uh, practically speaking. Uh, the question uh, about <laughs> the South Korean scandal that's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can go up for hours speaking about that scandal, <laughs> but uh, as it stands today, uh, my sense is that uh, this scandal has not affected policymakers uh, who deal with 
who work on North Korea and foreign policy. Uh, and my sense is that the current plan is to continue with existing approaches and policies. Uh, now, while that is still in place, in my sense is that the chain of command is still in place for that issue. Um, but going forward, and even the policymakers themselves uh, don't seem to know exactly what will happen to their chain of command and their portfolio, and who is a control tower, uh, should President Park be forced to step down. Uh, now, there are different scenarios of what could happen to her fate, uh, but um, so far, I mean, even with this uh, scandal, uh, they are, we are seeing the administration continue with plans. Um, she has ordered her, um, her people to, to try to, uh, by year's end, complete uh, GSOMIA, which is the intelligence sharing with Japan. Uh, and so, and we can expect, currently we can expect uh, the South Korean administration to continue with that deployment. Uh, but again, that th the fate of that depends on what happens if, if she is forced to step down, if they form a neutral cabinet where she does have, she may not have uh, the powers to exercise on foreign policy. We'll have to see that. Uh, the other uh, variable here is again, who is elected as the next South Korean president. Whether those elections are uh, occur ahead of schedule because of this situation or whether they happen on time in December next year. Uh, because if we see a progressive South Korean president, uh, the progressives would be more inclined to engage in uh, proactive engagement versus principled engagement, which is the current uh, policy for the conservatives. In terms of the what, what assurances can we give uh, North Korea well, I mean, the simple answer there is security assurances, and, and, and they know that. Uh, all six parties know what's on the table. They all know what we're dealing with. Uh, now, North Korea is surely uh, you know, concerned that, uh, and they don't trust the U.S. Uh, because they're concerned that their fate may be the same as Libya's. Uh, once they give up the nuclear weapons, perhaps the U.S. might invade them. And so in that sense, it would have to, uh, there would have to be a firm commitment that uh, the U.S. would not, and I cannot imagine a scenario where the U.S. would do this, but there would have to be a commitment that Washington would not invade the North once the North gave up uh, its uh, nuclear programs. Uh, and, and just as a side note, uh, in terms of uh, the Pyongjin Nosan, the simultaneous, the dual military economic development strategic line that they're employing. And this has been, Pyongjin has been uh, a decades old strategic line, it's nothing new, uh, but Kim Jong-un has revived it. Kim Jong-il didn't, uh, he only focused on the military first. Kim Jong-un has revived it uh, and he has given his tweak to it. Uh, so it's economic and military development, but he's given the tweak of putting in nuclear development uh, in the military uh, track and, and uh, Alexander, would probably know this better than I, but my interlocutors tell me that uh, the economic development track, they're, they're embarking on that track with uh, as much fervor as their nuclear development track. Uh, and I hear that they're even uh, moving some of their military personnel to engage in economic development. So that's how uh, fiercely they're trying to, to achieve both. Uh, now, whether that will be sustainable or not, we're not sure, but again, as someone already said this, that the, the North is good at adapting to sanctions, and their attitude uh, and their attitude and their comments clearly make it sound like they're saying, bring it on, bring on all the sanctions you want, we're still going on our course. Uh, and so uh, that, that currently is the dilemma. Now, the sanctions that are in place now and the sanctions that we're envisioning going forward really is to try to convince them to come to the negotiating table. Uh, and to curb their <laughs> nuclear weapons programs. Uh, and we've seen a precedent, we've seen that with BDA back in 2005. Uh, now in terms of um, uh, what Mark m mentioned about the EU and South Korean desires for isolation, yes. And we can, they are doing this, uh, they are courting EU, as you know very well, EU um, uh, states to, to, um, to help with the sanctions to help further isolate uh, the North. And this can be understood as their way of trying to build credible pressure and leverage. Uh, now, it, now, it may not seem like it on the surface, but they're still, the ROK is still firmly uh, um, committed to, uh, to diplomacy and engagement, but of course there are lots of preconditions. Uh, of course, the North has to show signs that it is serious about denuclearization. Uh, but this is the ROK's way, and uh, it, 
and they would not want to see holes in the uh, international community's unified front uh, towards this end. So that's why uh, we'll see this. Now again, a, a big uh, variable here is who is going to win the next South Korean presidential elections. And so that's when we would need to be prepared. Uh, of course, Washington would also have to be prepared in coordinating and syncing its coordination with uh, the new South Korean presidents. Thank you. Chang, do you want to add something? Uh, uh, assuming that I don't have questions, but uh, I just want to make one observation. The DPRK is a, a rational actor which always make wrong calculations. <laughs> Stop here. Yes. <laughs> very good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. This is very interesting because these are endless discussions. And these are endless discussions because the problem with DPRK is that for some countries, DPRK is a strategic issue, a, a, a card to play. And for other countries, it is a security issue, uh, a, 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 a program to be contained. And that, that, that's, I would say, the, the, the core of our problem. Thank you very much uh, for this, and, uh, and have a good reception and rings, etc. <laughs> Thank you.